Dr. James Rowling, Jr. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I think uh, Steve must have been one of the eight people in that audience at that. <laughs> that was, I think that was like my first presentation at, uh, at a National Art, Edu Art Education Association convention. Um, so, but he was in good company because um, Graham was there turning the slides, Jerome Hausman was there, I don't know why, um, but, <laughs> but, um, oh, here you go. Okay, so um, thank you for that um, uh, uh, that welcome and that uh, um, introduction. I also uh, want to thank everyone who invited me here to the uh, John Anderson Endowed Lecture Series. Um, can everyone hear me or do I need to speak louder? Okay. So what, I, uh, uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is, um, is a part of, uh, is an extension of some thinking I've been doing about um, the arts and education and the relation to, uh, to creativity um, and the origins of creativity in human beings um, and how it manifests itself in culture and society. Um, it stems from, it stems from uh, a book I recently wrote um, uh, called uh, Swarm Intelligence, looking at nature for some of the, uh, its cues about where uh, creativity stems from, um, rethinking notions about creativity, common notions about creativity, uh, through a metaphor, um, which is not so much of a metaphor, but more of a phenomenon. And um, I had a good conversation with um, one of the faculty here uh, last night. Um, it caused me to, to want to, to address uh, this subject matter, in, uh, starting from the uh, the concept of language, starting from the uh, uh, a look at language, because language is powerful. Um, this presentation is part of an effort to understand the social origins of creativity through one of the more persistent social behaviors that's found in nature. The tendency for humans, animals, insects to behave together in ways that are so likewise, so concerted, that many uh, uh, appear for a time, the many appear for a time to, be, to behave as one, as a swarm. But if we're being honest, the very idea of a swarm can raise negative connotations. Some of those connotations might be, for instance, that a swarm is mindless and uncontrolled. A swarm, for many, is considered to be dangerous. Um, compelled by some sort of zero-sum cascade effect impulse that seeks only to overwhelm all the other life forms occupying the same space um, for its own gain, like when you see a swarm of red ants going through a forest and sort of consuming everything as it, as it goes. Uh, for some, uh, the idea of a swarm connotes um, a phenomenon or an entity that doesn't produce or reproduce, um, but merely consumes or reacts to a perceived danger. And for others, uh, a swarm represents the loss or the absence of individuality, like the Borg Collective um, in the uh, Star Trek Next Generation series. So all these things are very powerful models and powerful concepts um, that, and models do shape understanding, of course. Uh, so this presentation, I want to begin with a story that offers or begins to introduce a different model um, of understanding this phenomenon in social, among social creatures. Um, uh, uh, wherein exchanges of thought and action and imagination that energize the human creative continuum are presented as examples of swarm intelligence, uh, a theory that I offer as a, uh, a theory of shared and mutually adaptive social advantages. So when I was a young student attending the High School of Art and Design in New York City, I sometimes chose to give my art away. This is an example of uh, 
my particular approach to art making, mixed media typically, oftentimes portraiture, in this case, lots of layers of color pencil and, and takes a lot of time. So um, being as methodical as I am as an art maker, uh, it, it, you know, and considering how much time it takes for me to, to make something, right? Uh, for me to give something away, um, it had to strike me that someone else needed it more than I did. So um, I started writing poetry in high school for similar reasons. You know, I would sometimes see folks who were, I was close to, who were in a place that I recognize emotionally. And I would write poetry just to give it away. Um, I knew what it felt like to suffer in silence. I was pretty introverted, isolated as a teen. And um, when I saw someone else at the risk of being swallowed in that same kind of abyss, I would um, double back through my own artistic portals, so to speak, uh, hoping to reveal an escape route that worked for me. So as I reflect back, I realized that I was intentionally practicing art as an altruistic exercise. Why? What response was I attempting to trigger in the receiver of my gifts? Literally, the gifts I would be giving to them. It's clear that at the time, I sought little more than to stake. Um, I was once in your shoes. I know a way to a better position. Follow me. See what happens. But taking a second look, the smallest acts of altruism have a way of spreading by creative contagions and to use social advantages, the stuff that cultures are made of. Why do we give little bits of ourselves away to those we associate with and care for? This kind of interpersonal exchange is the essence of art making, I would argue, um, but it's also the essence of altruism. Altruism is not concerned with the survival of the fittest but rather with the survival of the patterns that have proven to advantage and sustain us as human beings. However, thoughts and actions of individuals like you and me do not constitute cultural patterns in isolation. If I do something just by myself, it does not make a cultural pattern. Others have to be enticed to do likewise. The construction of whatever cultures that we call home um, of our most enduring systems of behavior require enticements, biocultural mechanisms that work like, like the excreted or secreted attractors in insect colonies, um, like chemical pheromones triggering a likewise response in the members of a local swarm. And I say like because we're human beings, we're not insects. So we're going to be talking about um, attractors that are not necessarily chemical pheromones, but um, produce very similar effects. Um, and I'll get to that in just a bit. Um, this communication is not just a chemical one in the, inse in, in the insect world. Um, there are other behaviors that entice, uh, such as the, um, the figure eight waggle dance performed in bee colonies, um, an odd behavior in which the, uh, the number of circuits communicated to hive mates um, and so as the bees sort of spin and do that waggle eight dance, if you've seen it on um, a National Geographic show. Um, those circuits uh, communicate the exact distance and location and direction to which to fly to find food or a new location for uh, uh, or to call home for a new hive. Obviously, now, once again, for most of us, most of us higher thinking human beings, it takes quite a bit more than the transfer of precious bodily fluids or chemical markers or waggle dances in order to cause ideas to spread. Allow, allow me to suggest that individual creativity is a collectively uh, fostered phenomenon. In other words, there are no orphan imaginations. Our imaginations take us from where we are to where we might be. But where we are is always the offspring of the proximal zone, the proximal zone of ideas, languages, materials, processes, and access that we have been born into. As a societal behavior, creative activity <clears throat> is indeed a catalyst for individual achievements, but first and foremost, it is a catalyst for human development and innovation. 
Hence, creativity <clears throat> has always been uh, and always had evolutionary implications. Civilization's most enduring achievements <clears throat> are the actions and products of creative swarms, each group adapting to the question or the quandaries at hand. Nevertheless, writ small, creativity also has utterly personal implications. This is why we paint ourselves in visual narratives, sing ourselves in lyric and verse, dramatize ourselves in the round, glorify ourselves in marble and clay, write ourselves into histories and her stories, dance ourselves into states of oblivion, and dream ourselves in abstracts through the night. The feedback loop between evolutionary growth and individual human development may be understood as a creative continuum. It's a fallacy, I would argue, to refer to creative individuals as if there were such a thing as a non-creative individual. Is there even such a thing as a less creative individual? And if you would argue that there are lesser creative individuals, I would ask you, I would challenge you to sort of reconsider why one person's lesser creative um, than another. According to Mahali Shikshant Mahai, what we call creativity always involves a change in a symbolic system, uh, a change that in turn will affect the thoughts and feelings of the other members of that culture. All individuals are equally predisposed to stir up changes as we live and move to the local symbolic uh, system, uh, the local symbolic continuum. As we make our presences felt to varying degrees, we create change. We each create meaning, meaning. We each create our own approach to language and conversation. We each create an identity in the world. We each create actions. As youngsters, we each create wild stories, imaginary friends, and playful diversions. We each create new questions as we experience our local worlds. When you or I walk through a space, we each create a unique trajectory or pathway. We each create relationships with one another. We each create common beliefs. We create situational behaviors and choose from an array of possible responses. We create change. We create culture. We create civilization. We create order or disorder. We create havoc. We procreate, we recreate, we create recreations. Indicting others of a perceived lack of creative activity or generativity is arguably less a matter of their innate psychological deficit than of contextual or circumstantial barriers to access, movement, and agency within symbolic systems that you personally uh, share membership in. Or uh, if you see neither the forest nor the trees that comprise another individual's semiotic shire, it's easy to understand your claim that you never saw them create a clearing and a dwelling place for meanings all their own. But it tells you nothing about their lack of creative activity. Traditional efforts to understand creativity have tended to run the gamut from biographical and historical approaches, clinical interventions, psychometric measures, correlational studies, applied strategies, systems approaches, developmental studies, case studies, cross-cultural inquiries, and computer modeling. This is not surprising. In a November 2012 posting on Public Radio International, one of my old mentors, James H. Borland, who's a, um, an expert in the field of giftedness, posted a, um, a talk. Um, he's a professor at Teachers College, Columbia University. He reflected upon the, a fundamental problem, simply that there is no agreement on what creativity is. And quoting uh, Jim, I'm not sure I have a definition of creativity. It's one of those human constructions that isn't discovered but invented. It's a word we use in everyday speech and it makes perfect sense. But when you start to study it and try to separate out its constituent parts, it becomes more and more confusing. So how does a swarm begin? The advance of a swarm begins just as any creative movement, movement does, um, with the general disorder and unfocused chaos of life. Scientific observations of the behavior of insects tossed into a large plastic cylinder 
um, just before um, coalescing into a swarm. So that what is manifested within that disorder, if you look for it, is a, pal is a palpable lack of progress in, for any of the individual insects, highlighted by endless collisions with obstacles, with walls, with one another. Biologists have learned that the key to converting this aimlessness, um, the aimlessness uh, displayed by these instinct, instincts into a swarming activity, is the enticement of enough individuals to align themselves and move in the same direction. Take it another way. What is overlooked in theories of individual creative um, processing is the role of social interaction. As social creatures, we are each constantly buffeted in the aftermath of a daily clash of competing aims and motivations as we encounter others traveling in divergent directions with entirely different frames of mind. Uh, this uh, jumble uh, routinely alters our own intellectual and emotional in inertia. Con consequently, we find ourselves swerving and converging and navigating new routes to our destinations. Shikshet Mahai, once again, presents a systems theory of the process of creativity, which he defines as a phenomenon that is constructed through an interaction between producer and audience, whereby creativity is not the product of single individuals, not the product of your own brain matter unto itself, but of social systems making judgments about individuals' products, waggle dances, pheromones, or stories, which is what I'll get to in just a moment. Um, and the actors in a swarm are not uh, blindly ramming each other into an alignment. Contrary, uh, uh, con contrary to this, they are actually attentive in their own lack of process, uh, progress and attempting to avoid collisions. Um, they are seeking a pathway that yields gainful momentum toward any, uh, toward or, or away from point A to point B, to the point just beyond. There is um, a method to the madness. So if your creativity is not locked, not locked within your own brain matter, what if, so actually let me just rephrase that. What if your creativity is not locked in your own brain matter? Because you may still hew to that notion. And I don't presume to shake you off of that through the course of one lecture, but this Consider for just a moment. What if your creative activity is neither your personal property nor your private advantage? In a social collective, each one creates. Every member is producer of expressions or actions or behaviors with the potential to entice or divert others to think or act or behave likewise. In other words, everyone is influence and each one is audience. If creativity is as collective as I am suggesting, a more apt understanding of the process of human development and individual achievement within the human creative continuum can be summarized as a phenomenon that is constructed through an interaction between members of a, sub, of a socio-cultural swarm, uh, whereby creativity is not the product of single individuals, but of social systems regulating themselves by feeding back cues toward the transmission and spread of ideas and behaviors that aid that system's resilience. A social system works to maintain the survival of its own, characteristics pat own characteristic patterns adaptively over time, hence its resilience, whether through growth, sometimes through contraction, sometimes through periods of equilibrium, and sometimes through evolutionary, evolutionary leaps. In other words, I'm arguing that social processes do not merely influence individual creativity. Social processes are the basis for the emergence and development of individual creativity. The process is both part and whole. In um, 2011, a video went viral on YouTube showing two young ladies in a canoe as they encounter a massive cloud of starlings wheeling uh, about over the River Shannon in Ireland. It's an amazing sight when a flock of thousands of birds um, suddenly changes direction at what appears to be exactly the same time. They're engaging in a form of collective intelligence, a phenomenon that is found in evidence across the animal world amongst all social creatures. 
This phenomenon also serves as a metaphor for collective, collaborative, creative leadership. The shape-shifting flock of starlings in this YouTube video, ebbing and flowing through the air at speeds of up to 20 miles per hour, is called a murmuration, a very odd word. I, I, don't, I look it up in the dictionary as far as its derivation, but it's called a murmuration. To view this phenomenon, and actually we're going to be taking a look at some uh, YouTube videos in just a second, if I can make this work. Um, to view this phenomenon is to glimpse a natural manifestation of the swarm intelligence common to all social animals, including human beings. In the case of a murmuration of starlings, the swarm is made up of thousands of small wing organisms, each bird acting on the basis of its, of its own individual perception of its um, and its own individual perceptions of its place in the, in, in the sky and, its, and making its own individual choices. Each starling in the flock will ultimately rotate into the front ranks at some point in the journey. Every bird in the flock chases after those in the lead. Every bird in the flock separates from those that are too close for comfort. Every bird aligns with those that are attempting to keep, that, that, they're, that they are attempting to keep pace with. And everyone, every, every uh, individual starling coheres with one another as they converge toward the same general, general direction. Extrapolating further, let's propose some alternative connotations for a swarm, because at the beginning of the talk, I talked about some of the negative connotations. Um, especially as we graduate our understanding of swarms from insect swarms to animal, beyond animal herds and flocks towards the dense clusters of human social interaction that produce cultures. So what I'm going to try to do here, let me escape this, and I think uh, I have some things queued up. Um, this, if you've never seen a murmuration, here it is. And I, I, have, I will admit that um, that because for me, uh, I, I seeing things metaphorically um, uh, is it's something that comes sort of natural to me. When I first saw this, believe it or not, I said, oh, that's what creativity looks like. That's what creative activity looks like. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look at it, it's what's fascinating here. You can actually see the waves of information Waves of information rippling across the the um, the, the the surface, uh, the surface tension, I guess, of this of these flocks, right? Um, as you know, you see, everyone's done the wave in in a, in a in a stadium. Well, there is there's information that's passed from one to the next to the next to the next, and each one makes a choice as to when to stand and when to raise their hands. And you can actually once again see as you. Oh, uh, uh, let me just. Um, I'll make sure I do this going forward. Um, it's a little bit easier to see. You can actually see when um, when information is passing through um, this horde of of um, creatures. And so I want to say, as I show these, um, a swarm. Uh, just once again, advancing our notions of the swarm. A swarm is a social network of individuals, uh, individual actors behaving for a time like minded, uh, like mindedly or self similarly. Um, the, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Um, thus, a swarm is a system of individual actors behaving relationally. This is not an either-or condition. Each of us is both. Uh, each of us uh, is both and. In other words, we are all correspondents within a swarm of activity. Um, we each produce idiosynchronous ideas. Um, while at the same time manifesting and reproducing synchronous thinking, um, the synchronous thinking of our families or our profession or our nation um, uh, or the overlapping subcultural groupings that we call home. We are each capable of leading and being led, as you see here. Everyone is capable of, be, of leading and being led at the same time. It's simultaneous. Okay. So let me just show you another video. Um, I, I guess I'll uh, escape. Um, and we'll, once again, I'm showing you these as metaphors, um, but also as, um, examples in the, in the animal world. Now what you're seeing here, um, is very much not about 
trying to move from point A. It's, it's more about trying to move away from point A. As a matter of fact, there's several points, point A's that's happening at the same time here. Um, uh, as the sardines each avoid, um, if you ask what the problem is, how do you avoid being eaten by a diving pelican or um, a shark or any of the big fish? How do you avoid that? Each individual fish is attempting to figure that out um, uh, in their own space and taking cues from the rest of the swarm that's surrounding them. Uh, so it's not so much about um, uh, the heading to, it's about the moving away from, but it does the same thing. It creates a swarming activity, which is fascinating to look at. And to me, uh, shapes that metaphor of, okay, so this is what happened when um, a certain intellectual movement or artistic movement became born. This is what happened um, during the Arab Spring. I see, uh, these are metaphors. Look at them as visual aids, right, of this kind of action amongst a collective where no one fish knows the entire landscape of everything that's happening, but is reacting um, to, um, to, uh, to the, the information it has at hand and making small, minute choices, um, but choices nevertheless. Um, I'll show you one more. Um, here, oh, but here I want to say here that a swarm, uh, by definition, is a superorganism. By definition, a superorganism exhibits a form of distributed intelligence, uh, a system uh, in which many individual agents with limited intelligence, and obviously fish have limited intelligence, but so are human, so are human beings. Um, uh, uh, agents with limited intelligence and, and limited information are able to pool resources to accomplish a goal beyond the capabilities of the individuals, a swarm intelligence. In this case, how do we as a, um, a school stay alive? and avoid being eaten. Very simple, very simple story. But it gets more complex when we get to human beings. So let's go to one more sample, which I thought was cool. So um, I remember uh, coming across this and it, is, it creates some, uh, it, gets, it gives it to me a visual aid of, of understanding what a school of thought is. Um, so this apparently is a square um, uh, somewhere, uh, yeah, I didn't, it's, I think it's in somewhere in, in, in Ethiopia. I could be wrong. Um, what, what is it? Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa. Uh, so, so each automobile and each individual, uh, <laughs> represents a very, very simple, um, goal. How do I avoid dying um, in the midst of this inter intersection? Um, how do I avoid it a, a collision? Um, no one person and no one vehicle has the entire picture of what is going on in that intersection. But each is able to, amazingly, avoid a death um, a causing a, 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 a collision. Um, each individual is is making small decisions that um, that for the sake of the hospitals in that location, you know, keep 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 no keep no nobody coming in, nobody 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 enters the hospital that day. It might happen right after this video. I don't know, uh, but no for this moment for this two minutes, no individual enters the hospital. Right, no one gets started away by by ambulance. So a swarm is a school of thought. The act of schooling, best understood as a behavior instigated by a common prompt. At the most base level, that prompt might be the need for an, a new queen or to find food um, or a response to a threat to the hive. But at, at its most sophisticated, the only chemical pheromone needed, right? Uh, let me just uh, back that up a little bit. At its... Um, at its most sophisticated, the only chemical pheromone that's needed to instigate a school of thought is the emotional bond of sharing a common need or visual attachment to a common story or a common language or a common ancestry or a common destiny. Um, uh, what I'm getting at is that stories, whether it be um, my need to survive a particular day uh, or the fact that we live in such and such a country and we're the greatest country that ever existed or um, on the ne negative side, um, we believe that those people over there are evil, 
right? Because we want to get we don't want to be naive about the fact that um, some folks, um, some swarming behavior is used um, is is centered around stories that are um, um, not helpful to human development that actually cause the destruction of others. Um, so let me go back to the slideshow and we'll, we'll try to wrap this up. Uh, here we go, slideshow, play from current slide. Okay. So, um, so stories um, in themselves, as you know, um, create visceral emotional attachments. And to me, and to my mind, argue uh, work the same way as chemical pheromones work in an insect, right? Um, so um, let's take a look at some of the some of the some of the group decision making. Um, uh, I would call them laws, things that you see in any given swarm of activity. Uh, so it'll help us understand it better in terms of what you're seeing because it's a, it's complex. Even if, even if you look at what you just saw there, there's a lot of complexity taking place. But I, I would like to try to simplify. So um, common to all social creatures. This group decision-making intelligence manifests itself um, to some extent by folks chasing individual members of a swarm of activity, chasing after those that are directly ahead of them in the ranks of leadership, fostering their own adaptability and forward, forward momentum over time in the adherence of what I would call the law of succession. The members of a swarm of thinkers separate from those that are too close for comfort, preventing a chain of disorienting or disabling collisions that would slow the progress of the group towards its next position in adherence to the law of separation. The members of a swarm learn to align with those alongside them, keeping pace with a cohort of peers so that no member of the group gets left behind in accordance with the law of alignment. And finally, the individual members of a swarm of social activity cohere together with those uh, in their vicinity, coalescing so as to arrive at point B at just about the same time, ensuring the greatest critical mass through strength and security of overwhelming numbers as they converge upon their selected target in accordance with the law of cohesion. Swarm intelligence uh, is a theoretical concept that makes sense of the social origins of creativity and makes visible its life-sustaining and evolutionary purpose. The concept of swarm intelligence offers an explanation as to why ideas first capture our, our attention and then affect our behavior, and then ultimately spread. But here's the key. Um, individuals never travel to point B alone. Uh, don't believe the hype about individual achievement. Human beings are social creatures first. We survive our infancy because of the family units that foster us. We speak and perceive the world just like the social populations in which we are embedded. And we are swept into the future on the currents and eddies of, uh, that our culture has churned as it interacts with the rest of the world. Likewise, our most significant performances of achievement as a human race are those achievements of collective mass and momentum, as when an improved idea, a better mousetrap, so to speak, um, an improved idea or process suddenly chases ahead to the fore past the good practices and actions that, were, that once preceded, or when a thought or a way of thinking finally separates itself from the jam of competing ideas out of which it emerged to make itself useful to many or when new partners choose to align so that no one is left behind, or when disparate parties converge to seek and secure the common good. It follows that the greater the synergy and mass of social uh, of movement, the greater momentum towards uh, the uh, point B. We can postulate that creative achievement is the product of unique life experience and the agency it affords within any given social group augmented by the information individuals can access and make use of such as that and as that information compounds exponentially. Thus, for the sake of argument, creative achievement is equivalent to the agency of experience multiplied by the information an individual has access to as that information conti continues to compound itself. Given the right conditions, experience can be converted to creative behavior since life experience is simply one of the manifestations of thoughts, ideas, words, and actions that we can create. This equivalence is a consequence of the constancy of information, whether in verbal or visible or written forms. Information is independent of your own embodied frame of reference. Information can be left behind as a cue or as an enticement, let's say in the form of a book or in a painting or as a work of architecture. Likewise, information behaves as a constant, appearing and behaving the same way across all frames of reference. Uh, access to information always deepens experience and creativity. 
What changes is the interpretation or translation of the value of that information from one person's frame of reference to the next. So there's some implications that I'd like to close with. Um, there are several uh, implications of, of this uh, shared theory, of this theory of shared mutually adaptive social advantages. First, if creativity is more than an individually owned trait and is more accurately understood as a set of behaviors stemming from and sustained through our relational transmissions, it represents a remedy to the powerful mythology that some people are gifted with special creative capacities while most others are not. If creativity originates as a social behavior, its outcomes are immediately amplified when we transmit our ideas or our materials or our tools in schools or in workplaces or on our own time as gifts. Every act of sharing, altruism, gift giving, social networking, exchange has the potential to alter the script for everyone in the play who contributes a verse. But secondly, um, in proposing these alternative understandings and connotations of swarming behavior, we also create some new and I think useful associations for the concept of swarm intelligence. Swarming behavior is purposeful. Uh, sorry, it's purposeful. It, it's never sustained, even in, in insect colonies, and certainly not amongst human colonies. Um, swarming behavior is purposeful, and it's never sustained beyond the fulfillment of its particular purpose. Instead, the behavior ceases. And then when some new need arises or some new enticement, then swarming behavior begins again. And the culture continues to grow and develop and shape shift and adapt. Swarming behavior, um, the intrinsic purpose of swarming behavior is not to destroy. Rather, it is a behavior that is common to all social creatures. The main purpose being to reproduce and proliferate a set of behaviors that are mutually beneficial to those neighboring and that opt to do likewise. That said, it would be absolute naive to uh, not to recognize that any swarm that coheres around a story of its own, for instance, collective superiority, or of some other neighboring groups, uh, group's inferiority or dispensability, easily leads to the invention of destructive behaviors. History is replete with such instances, but even more so with the phen phenomenon that I think is much more important to understand and take away from the understanding of, of uh, swarming behaviors, um, which is that, um, so, so I, here I turn to a 1949 book um, that was introduced to me actually by uh, Charles Groyan, who's not here today, um, a 1949 book called The Accursed Share, um, and wherein uh, French intellectual George Bataille proposes a meta-economic theory of consumption, which advances the premise that the natural social interaction between human beings, the interactions that happen every day, those, those behaviors that, through which we connect and network, they generate an excess of energy that must be expended and used up in one way or another. On one hand, the surplus energy is either converted into the sumptuous aesthetic transmissions or sacred offerings, our aesthetic impulses, our religious impulses um, that are not for profit. They're, they're, they serve no other purpose but to develop our collective humanity like flowering plants. Or, and this is a Bataille's argument, um, this uh, excess energy um, gets wasted in the form of aggressive, zero-sum, empire-building surges that pulverize underfoot any so-called competing humanity to serve either as topsoil or as fodder for profit and gain of that particular swarm. Um, so swarming behavior that produces surplus aggression is obviously a phenomenon that we can do it do without, right? Um, it's a thing that we all fear. On the other hand, surplus human energy in the form of the artistic gifts that we give to one another so as to strengthen the patterns that sustain us, that have sustained us, the patterns of interaction that make us more human. These are on display in humanity's great civilizations and cultures in our enduring artistic and intellectual and spiritual movements, or simply when masses of people spontaneously pour out into the streets to activate an outcry for social justice, or an Arab Spring. 
the effect of swarming behaviors is ecosystemic, finally, the final implication. Uh, it's ecosystemic. It's like an ecosystem. So, so in other words, they don't, uh, one swarm doesn't operate in isolation. It's not like a scientific experiment where you, where you can isolate something from all other variables. They all interact with each other at the same time, right? So, um, and it's somewhat of a cascade effect. Um, one, uh, prox one, proximal, one group's behaviors prompt responding or corresponding behaviors in proximal social networks or schools of thought. At our most altruistic, we give little bits of ourselves away because such are the actions that hold us together. We form beautifully crafted reflections of the world we've experienced. Or we inform new ideas emerging from ongoing and complicated conversations. Or we transform present conditions into future questions and possibilities because such are the objects and expressions and sacred interventions that we grasp as handholds along the way. We perform ourselves as we desire to be. There is no profit, no personal profit to be gained in such activity from, from such swarming behaviors. A different purpose is served. This is the social imagination, the building up of the social imagination, each one contributing his or her surplus energies in order to benefit and build up the world that we share. This is creative, uh, sorry, this is creativity or creative activity, human development in action, one individual being influenced and influencing the next. In other words, the origins of your next meaningful idea are social. Call and response. That can call. Call and response. Thank you.